Well, good evening. Last week, Sunday morning, we had opportunity to begin chapter 5 of 1 John 5. And we looked at the first five verses and we saw, I trust, that uh, we love the Father by loving the children of God. And we saw that the way that God has prescribed that we love the children of God is through keeping the commandments. And that for the believer, God's commandments are no longer burdensome. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And we saw that because of the victory of Jesus over sin and death, we as his disciples can overcome the world through our faith in him. And uh, as I prepared to, to preach the second half of the sermon this week, after the week of turmoil that we've experienced both in our country and our church, I wondered whether it was going to be a little tone deaf to just continue to preach the next section of whatever books we were considering, Numbers and First John but how wonderful it is not only to have a God of merciful providences, but also to have a shepherd who uh, is concerned and loves our church. Uh, and so I was grateful this morning for Doug and his emphasis drawing out the application that is so relevant from Numbers chapter 15 this morning. And my conclusion after thinking about whether this is tone deaf was, was that it's not. It's not never tone deaf to preach the word. Because the answer to life's deepest problems is always the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. Faith in Christ is, after all we saw last week, what overcomes the world. And so preaching about Christ is always relevant. And I trust that uh, as we consider him tonight, you will be encouraged and your faith will be bolstered. So one of John's major goals throughout this book has been to instill this confidence in the lives of his children. He wants them to be sure of who they are in Christ as a result of the gospel. And the reason that he wants him to be sure of these things is because their faith had been unsettled by the teaching of the Gnostics uh, as they asserted certain heresies which, which attacked the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we saw last week, our only hope of loving one another and obeying the commandments of God and overcoming the world is rooted in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the song goes, our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus and his righteousness. The Gnostics were coming into the church and because of their teaching about the essential goodness of spiritual things and the essential evil of the material world, they had posited a weird and heretical separation within the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that the separation of the Son of God and the man Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Orthodox Christian teaching asserts some very hard-to-explain truths about Jesus. It does so by taking seriously all of the revealed truth about God, rather than just emphasizing one particular aspect of that truth, which incidentally is how most heresies come about. Orthodox Christology, the study of Christ, or right doctrine about Christ, teaches that the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead, eternally coexistent and co-equal with the Father, nevertheless submitted himself to the Father, took on human flesh, was born of a virgin, lived and suffered and died for the sins of the people that he came to redeem. He was then buried and rose again from the dead on the third day. And all of this, I trust, sounds very familiar to your ears, and so it should, but it takes for granted some very difficult to understand but essential assumptions. We believe that Jesus wasn't just a man and he wasn't just the Son of God. Jesus was the God-man. That is that he was fully God and he was fully man at the same time. Not 50% God and 50% man. Fully God and fully man. Who can, who can explain that? Theologians have studied and discussed the details surrounding this and have come up with various words and phrases which help us to understand and communicate these things a little more effectively. They speak about Jesus having a divine nature and a human nature in hypostatic union, and it gets quite confusing. And if you're interested in going into that in a little bit more detail, there's an excellent book by Stephen Wellham called Jesus, the Son of God Incarnate. Now this that we've been speaking about, this is orthodox Christology. Yet the Gnostics in John's day were upsetting the faith of some by undermining their confidence in who Jesus was. Was he actually who he said he was? Was he actually able to save their sins, save them from their sins? Now understandably, 
calling into question the person of Jesus Christ, would shake these believers. Who was Jesus? Was he really the Son of God? Did he really die and did his death really accomplish all that he said it would accomplish? Could they really be certain that by their placing their faith in Jesus, that he would really be able to atone for their sins by being the sacrificial lamb of God? Can we, as a church, have any certainty about Jesus' ability to have saved Auntie Beryl and to have saved Hermon? After all, sins against an infinite God and perfect God can only be atoned for fully and finally by an infinite perfect sacrifice. John, having spent some time speaking about some of the evidences of those who do believe in Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, now wants to turn to address the question of Jesus' qualifications himself. Who was he, and how could these believers, and by extension, how can we have confidence in Christ as our Savior? So turn with me, if you aren't there already, to 1 John chapter 5, and we'll read uh, we'll read the first 12 verses, but we'll be focusing on that second part, verses 6 to 12. John writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has that testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So now John is, is drawing our attention to who Jesus is. Why is it that faith in Jesus has any value? He wants us not only to have confidence in our own being in Christ, but also in who Jesus actually was. And in order to do so, John employs a sort of courtroom type setup. And the, these three components of the courtroom setup will serve as our points for this evening, our headings, if, you're, uh, if you need that for your, your following along. So the first would be, who is it who testifies? We need to ask that question. Who is making this testimony? Secondly, what is the testimony? And thirdly, who are the witnesses? So who testifies, what is the testimony, and who are the witnesses? Many people, I find, in considering this particular passage of Scripture, seem to jump straight into asking who the witnesses are. But before we can ask who the witnesses are, we need to know whose testimony is being backed up by the witnesses and what the testimony is. So firstly, who is it who testifies? Well, we see the answer to this question in verses 9 and 10. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So quite clearly there, God himself is the one who testifies, and these witnesses are backing up God's testimony. Now you'll remember back to our study in, in Leviticus, how in the Old Testament law given to Israel, in order to establish guilt in a court of law, you couldn't just accept the testimony of one single witness. You needed to have two, or even three was, was even better. Deuteronomy 19.15 spells it out and says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. 
Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall the charge be established. Now, God himself doesn't call us to stake our lives and our eternities upon the evidence of one single witness. But he goes and graciously applies the standard to himself. God has given three witnesses to the truth that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus himself, while he was on earth, made reference to the same standard when he said, But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, and his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Now we made this point last week that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen from Hebrews 11 verse 1. And particularly faith in Christ is what overcomes the world. Now it's often said that, that someone takes a leap of faith, which makes it seem like faith is blind. But here we see that faith is called for, but it's, it's, very op it's the very opposite of what blind is. In fact, our faith is extremely reasonable. God is the one who testifies that Jesus is his son. And God's testimony is itself trustworthy. Because we already know, Hebrews 6 verse 18 makes it clear, that it is impossible for God to lie. So certainty is added to certainty as we see that the one who testifies is trustworthy and we have evidence and witnesses that back up his testimony. So that is who the testimony belongs to. The testimony is made by God himself. But secondly, what is this testimony? Look at verse 11, which says, And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. So very simply, this means that originally God did not create us to die. We, didn't, we weren't created for death. Death came as a result of sin. Now that's not to say that God was surprised by Adam's sin. Indeed, we've been chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world, Ephesians says. So God planned to glorify himself in redeeming sinful man from the start. But the fact remains that death came as a result of man's sin and rebellion. Death has then reigned from Adam to the present day because all have sinned. Indeed, last week we were reminded that it is natural brokenness which causes us to sin. We have this predilection to sin because we were born with the sin of our forefather Adam. So when we hear the law of God, our sin, sinful flesh rises up and rebels. So death is then reigned from Adam to the present day. But Jesus Christ came as the second Adam and succeeded where the first Adam failed. Just as the first Adam stood representing all those who would follow him, all his descendants, so those who are represented by Christ and are in him are counted righteous because he is righteous. Jesus came to die in the place of sinners as a perfect sacrifice and he was therefore able to atone for all the sins of man. Not only that, but his righteousness is credited to the, life, to the lives of those who put their faith in him. This is basically the gospel in a nutshell. Once again, I must pause at this point to ask, have you confessed your own sinful brokenness? Have you put your only hope for redemption in the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world? Because if not, you have no hope in the face of death. Death is coming for us all, perhaps sooner than you anticipated. And after death, we will face judgment. But for all those who are in Christ, just as he was raised from the dead, so we know we too will be raised from the dead. Romans 6 verse 4, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do you see this connection? Jesus, if he is who he says he is, then we are connected to him by faith. Romans 8 verse 11, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 15, 
Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So we see that the testimony of God is that eternal life comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are connected to him by faith have life. And those who are not connected to him by faith remain necessarily connected to Adam and therefore do not have life. So as Paul writes to the Corinthians, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are most to be pitied. Who wants to have life in this? Who wants to have hope in this life only? Certainly if this week hasn't shown you how, how disappointing this life is, then I don't think anything will. This life is not worth living for if this life is all there is. Everything, therefore, hinges on whether the testimony of God about Christ is true. So we've seen that the testimony belongs to God, and we've seen that the testimony that he has made is that eternal life is found in Jesus, the Son of God, alone. So then thirdly, who are the witnesses? Now John points to the witness of the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Three witnesses. As, the, as a witness, the Spirit, I think, is, is fairly self-explanatory. John is clearly speaking about the Holy Spirit of God. I don't think there's anyone out there that disputes that. But the water and the blood are the two witnesses where there have been so many theories put forward about what these are. What does John actually mean? But as I've meditated on this and wrestled with this passage in my own preparation, I've found it to be immensely helpful to remember the context. If we start by conjecturing about water and blood, then that symbolism is so rich throughout Scripture that you'll end up coming up with all sorts of fantastic ideas. But remember, John has been at pains to point us to Jesus who is the Christ. We see that clearly in verses 1 and verses 5. So that means that the Spirit, the water, and the blood are witnesses in support of Jesus coming as the Christ, the Son of God, by whom we have eternal life. So that's what they're saying. That's what they're testifying to. Recall that I mentioned that the Gnostics had this strange teaching that was shaking the faith of the believers that John was writing to. They were teaching, the Gnostics, that Jesus of Nazareth was a mere man who was then sort of possessed by the Son of God at his baptism. And then the Son of God left him on the cross. And the man that died was merely Jesus of Nazareth, wasn't Jesus the God-man. Now, naturally, this would shake the faith of believers to whom John was writing. It should shake their faith. Because it's very important that Jesus was this inseparable God-man, the Son of God, we know that Jesus was utterly unique in that Jesus was the only one who, being clean himself, could touch something unclean and instead of becoming unclean, could confer his cleanness on that unclean thing. And that's, that's so important because that's exactly what we need on the cross. On the cross, we as unclean sinners must come and as we partake of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need his cleanness to be transferred to us. And that can only happen if Jesus is the supernatural Son of God. If he is this indivisible God-man who died at Calvary. A mere man's death would not have resulted in us becoming clean. It would, would merely have resulted in us being further contaminated. So John writes in order to restore their confidence in the truth of this cleansing. And so he naturally defends these points at which the Gnostics were attacking the person of Christ. He defends Jesus' divinity at his, I believe, his baptism and his death. 
And as I've already said, everyone agrees that Jesus was the Son of God present at his baptism, which marks the, the start of his formal earthly ministry. Why do we say that? Well, if you turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in verse 29, we see John writes, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. This is John the Baptist. He saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who, was bef who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water. And just note that. This is Je John, Jesus' cousin, saying he didn't know Jesus. Now, is it likely that he was speaking about not recognizing his cousin? I would say probably not. I think he's probably speaking about Jesus, the Son of God. I myself did not know him, he writes, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So this is the witness, I believe, of the water. The Spirit descends bodily on Jesus as a dove, and the voice of the Father audibly affirms Jesus as his beloved Son with whom he is well pleased. Now this is something that is, is everyone agreed on, which is why John makes it clear that this is not the only way in which Jesus came to us as the Son of God. He says, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only. This is the Gnostics believed that Jesus came at his baptism, but by the water and the blood. So John takes pains to help us to see that it was not that Jesus came by the water only. No, Jesus came by the water and the blood, and the Spirit bears witness, and these three agree. So let's take a look at the second witness, the blood. For this, you can turn with me to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. Here, God gives us a prophecy through Zechariah about the Messiah. We read, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps for a firstborn. And then if you skip down to Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And now you can flip back, if you want to, to the Gospel of John chapter 19 and verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate for, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. And that's the scripture in Zechariah that we've just read. And not only that, not only did, do we see that the, the water and the blood came out, and this was in fulfillment of prophecy, but we also see that at the cross where Jesus breathed his last, last breaths, there was an earthquake, there were three hours of supernatural darkness, and then Jesus gave up his spirit, saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. All witnesses from God to the fact that this was no mere man. Three days later, Jesus' authentic sacrifice for sins was vindicated when God raised him from the dead. And then finally, the third witness. It is the Holy Spirit who is given to all believers 
taking the merits of Christ and applying them to our lives, enabling us to obey without the commandments being burdensome, and changing and transforming us into the image of Jesus, the Son of God. It's the Holy Spirit who bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, according to Romans 8, verse 16. And notice verse 10 in, in 1 John chapter 5. Verse 10 says, Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. And Acts 5.32, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So John wants his children to have confidence in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because confidence in Christ is the ground of our faith. 1 John 5 verse 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? John wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to be able to know that we have eternal life. And as we will see when we return to 1 John in future, John wants us to have confidence that God also therefore hears our prayers and answers our prayers. It all depends on whether Jesus is who he says he is. If, only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, can he atone for our sins once and for all. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he crush the head of the serpent. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he come and do better than Adam, the Son of God, and stand as our federal head, our legal representative for all those who belong to him. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he rise from the dead and promise that one day we too will rise from the dead. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he ascend to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he go to prepare a place for us. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he mediate for us before the throne of God. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, could he send his Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to come and dwell with us. Only if Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, can we have any hope of him returning to earth one day to take us to be with him, away from sin and pain and fear and death. So I trust that this evening your confidence in God has been bolstered. We've seen that God has tes testified to Jesus being his son. We've seen that God has sent three witnesses that we can look to and build our faith upon. Faith is hope and confidence assurance based on evidence, and we have evidence given by the water and the blood and the Spirit. So if you're a believer, I hope that your faith would be strengthened and that you, it would, the strong faith would enable you to overcome doubts in these dark days that we find ourselves in. Saints throughout the ages have found that faith in Christ Jesus, the Son of God incarnate, has carried them through many dangers, toils, and snares, some far deeper than those that we ourselves face today. And if you're not a believer, perhaps you should acknowledge tonight that your unbelief is not nearly so rational as you used to think. In fact, with the evidence of the blood, the water, and the Spirit, the only reason that you continue your unbelief is because you're suppressing the knowledge of God. You're suppressing the truth about God because you know that to believe would mean that you need to change. You would no longer be the captain of your own life. You would need to bow the knee to King Jesus. But friend, that's just your flesh speaking. Listen to the words of Jesus himself. At that time, Jesus declared, Father, I thank you, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children, Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we know that the only reason Jesus could say those words is because he was, in fact, the Son of God. The God-man came to 
stand in the place of Adam and represent all those who would put their faith in him. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that our faith is reasonable. We thank you for the evidence that you've given us in the blood and the water and the spirit. And Lord, we thank you especially for the Holy Spirit who testifies with our own souls that we are children of God. And we pray, Lord, that you would please uh, strengthen our faith and may our faith carry us through dark days. We pray for all those who are not believers. We pray, Lord, that they would be confronted with this evidence and I ask, Lord, that they would submit themselves and bow the knee to Christ. So, Lord, bless us in this, this week, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.